the mic. So welcome. My name is Rich Cowper. I'm a solution architect. Uh, and today, I'm assuming most of you are in here to hear about SNS Mobile Push, right? Cool. How many people are app developers? You actually write code. Awesome. A lot of people. How many people are just managing app developers that write code? Some of those, too. Cool. How many people are doing push in their app? Pretty good handful. Android? iOS? Kindle? Windows? A couple of those, too. Great. Well, we're going to have a little bit of something for everybody throughout this presentation. So uh, hopefully you enjoy it. I am an, I'm a network engineer <laughs> by background. And here I am talking about developing code. Uh, a bit of a weird thing for a network engineer, but I'm mostly iOS based. So although I will certainly try to include the other platforms as much as I can, unfortunately my demos are all in iOS. So please forgive me if you're not iOS based. A lot of the concepts are the same. In fact, a lot of them are pretty much the same. It's just the syntax that changes. So I want to talk about a couple of different things uh, today. The first thing is, why do we push when we send push notifications? Why do we do it? Uh, I want to talk about how we push, how we've pushed in the past, and how we can push in the future. I want to talk about the evolution of push. Things have changed since we were given the ability to send push notifications. And I want to talk about some of the ways that you, know, you can use some of our services to help enable your push notifications. Since we talked last year, if you are here last year, we've made some changes, as all Amazon, service, Amazon Web Services services do. We iterate quickly. Got some new cool things to talk to you about. Uh, so hopefully you'll find those interesting. Um, and then I want to show how it all works, you know, making the assumption that you are not familiar with the way Amazon SNS Mobile Push works. Um, including a live demo, so we're going to tempt the demo gods today and hope that the Wi-Fi and the cellular networks work so that I can actually receive stuff from APNS. Uh, I'm going to show you, I'm going to bring up Xcode and show you some of the underlying code of, of a really simple application that I've written uh, that shows some of the features. Uh, we also uh, are joined today by um, one of our customers, Mailbox, and they're going to come up a little bit later and tell you about um, the way they're using SNS Mobile Push to enable their application uh, from a user experience perspective and from a scalability perspective. So, uh, you know, a little bit deeper into the real world use case, not just silly little demo apps that we, that we write over the weekend. So why do we do this? Why do, you know, you know we've got mobile applications and we know mobile is, was the, the biggest, greatest thing two or three years ago when we started writing applications, maybe a little bit longer than that. Um, but why do we actually care about sending push notifications? Well, uh, the blog at Flurry uh, about a year ago now, so the stat's probably a little dated, but probably still relatively true, is that 65% of mobile apps are abandoned within the first 90 days. And why is that? How many people have installed an application and then logged into it once and never gone back? Lots. I probably have 200 applications on my phone. I don't even know what they do. Uh, and why is that? Because I don't think about the applications. It's always just the next cool thing. I grab it, download it, try it once. You know, kind of really doesn't meet my expectations, so I never go back to it. Why we push is to uh, build engagement with our end users, get them back into the platform. And this has become more and more sophisticated over time as we've figured out how to do this. And, you know, it's the same as anything. We, we figure out just the simple, hey, here's a push message just to remind you that I'm here. And then we start to get a little bit more complicated about how we do things. Really, it's table stakes for any application these days. I, you know, I can't think of any... You know, there's probably maybe a few side cases or, or, or end cases that um, push doesn't make sense for, but I, I can't think of any. Can you? You pretty much need to be pushing in your application to, unless you've got some real cool thing that drives your users back to your application constantly, you need to enable push. The cool thing about push notifications is very targeted. Users select, they, they opt in to receiving notifications to you. So it's not spam, it's not email, it's not all the junk mail you get at home. And more recently, notifications are building on the user interface and the user experience of your application with some of the new features out of the new platform. So we're gonna show you some of that too. So have we done this in the past? Well, we talked to a lot of our customers and we heard that push is complicated. How many people have felt the pain of trying to push to multiple platforms? Yeah. Why is it painful? Well, every single platform is a little bit different, or a lot different in some cases. 
They have different APIs, they have different features, they have different feedback mechanisms, they have different ways of managing your reputation, and you've got to code to every single one of those things in an efficient way. You know, and that's not so bad if you're thinking about just writing an iOS application and sending it out to the App Store and, be, and being done with it, but we don't live in a world where there's only a single platform. We've got multiple platforms that we need to interact with. And once we've figured out how to interact with all these different APIs, we've discovered that it's hard to scale these things because now we've got different platforms that interact differently, and we have to start to be able to send more and more push notifications as we get more sophisticated about how we're sending push notifications to users. And as our app grows with an adoption, as, as more users download the application and get involved with the app, it becomes harder and harder to scale. You, know, you can imagine a back-end system, of, of if, you, if you've never written a, a push back-end system, you've got databases with different types of IDs and tokens and all these different things you need to maintain that's gotta grow as you go to you know, a billion users. It's a lot of rows in the database. Um, you know, there's other things that you have to take into consideration in terms of being able to send push efficiently, effectively, and reliably. So it's hard to scale. So what we've done to get through this is we built an intermediary. It's usually a service within our application tier that interacts with these different APIs, and we figured out how to scale them. And if we're running them on EC2 or uh, a platform, we're scaling them up and scaling them out as we grow. But all that is heavy lifting that you guys don't necessarily need to do, because guess what? you, Mr. Developer, over here, and you, Mr. Developer, over here, regardless of the platform that you're sending to, the general functions of sending a push between your two different platforms are the same, right? It's the same as anything else. Get away from the undifferentiated heavy lifting of managing these types of systems when that's not adding true value to your app. This is where Amazon SNS mobile push comes into play. So we have a service that allows you to become that it becomes that intermediary layer that we used to write and maintain and you know, make, make updates to and security patches and all those types of things. And it interacts with all the different, you know, I shouldn't say all of the different, but all of the popular platforms with a single API. What does that mean? Well, that means that our backend infrastructure is a lot less complicated to maintain from a code perspective. We're sending push notifications in relatively the same way whether we're sending to Iowa APNS, whether we're sending to Google Cloud Messaging, whether we're sending to uh, Amazon uh, ADM for Kindle devices. We don't have that many of much variation in terms of our backend API. And the cool thing about that is, is that everybody, you know, mostly everybody starts with one platform. You know, it's usually whatever the developer that you hired, it's iOS or Android, right? Um, and then when we want to go to add another platform, when you've done it the old way, you're like, oh, now we've got to write a whole another application tier just to be able to deal with the other platform. If you code against a single API that, in, that generally reacts the same way with some, you know, a couple of specific things for the different platforms because they have different features, um, it makes your life a lot easier. And the other side of this, of course, is scale. So once you've figured out that, that backend intermediary system and you're scaling it up and down based on your demand as much as you can, you know, it's still a pretty complicated system to maintain and scaling might not work for whatever reason and maybe there's a bad code push that makes scaling break. Like those types of things are, are issues that you deal with every day on any type of application stack. With SNS mobile push, you scale from you know, a few pushes, usually in the sandbox, give things a try, to millions of pushes or billions of pushes without any provisioning. So don't add any more servers. And you're still interacting with the same API. Everything's working the same. You've just extended how far your reach is significantly without having to do any heavy lifting on your end. And that turns into cost effectiveness. So think about, again, if you've built this intermedi intermediary system on the back end, let's, let's make an assumption you've built a small one on top of EC2. So you've got a single T2 micro Linux EC2 instance that's interacting with GCM and APNS and uh, Baidu and all these different different platforms. Uh, we have a, a small MySQL database just to be able to maintain all the device tokens and all the various subscription I identification and all those things that we need for all the different platforms. We've purchased one-year reserved instances because reserved instances are a great way to reduce our costs on EC2, so why wouldn't we do that? And on RDS. And our yearly cost for maintaining that very small platform, $392.88 if you do it in US East, uh, US East 1, in Northern Virginia. Um, Let's compare that to what we could do with Amazon SNS Mobile Push. So the pricing model for Amazon SNS Mobile Push is uh, 
50 cents per million of publishes, which is you sending a message to us to, to deliver to something, and then 50 cents per million for a direct push, for a, sorry, a push out to an end, of, uh, end point. So with $392 per year to run that small platform, we can push 393 million push notifications. That's 44, uh, 45,000 push notifications an hour. My question would be on this, and, and I'm sure some of you are thinking that too, is you know, a T2 Micro and a MySQL database that's on T2 Micro, that's kind of small. Will that be able to handle that type of throughput? Probably not. Right? We would need to start to scale that up pretty significantly. In another vein, there's other ways to interact with our users using SNS topics, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But if we're going to do that, we can send up to 787 million pushes. It's a lot of push for not a lot of money. So, you know, something to think about when you're maintaining these back-end systems, that by switching over to a platform that allows you to do this a lot easier, there's, there's cost savings on, you know, saving on what you're running, but also all of the, the soft costs as well around maintaining it. Now let's talk about the evolution of push a little bit, and then we'll get into some technical stuff, I promise. So we know these use cases very, very well. You know, we've been sending push notifications for a while, and really we've got three key things that we've been trying to do, use in the past. A direct push notification sent to a specific device, to a specific app running on a specific device. That's sort of, that's where they started with this whole push notification thing. The ability to send broadcast messages, right? Send one message that then gets fanned out to millions of devices with a single drop into an API. And then we started to get more sophisticated around closed loop interactions. And what we mean by closed loop interactions is starting to get very understanding on when we're sending a push notification and what the context and the content of the push notification is based on the context of the application and the user and their use case and what they're doing. Right? So you can think of a push notification if you walk into a, a Starbucks and get some sort of a no notification about a, spe a specific deal that day. It's very, very targeted, but we've got back-end infrastructure to make that happen. And we've got sort of mishmash of these three different use cases that we uh, develop into our applications. But if you think about it, um, you know, when we pull these things together, we can change the way we push. So like I said, direct and broadcast are pretty simple on Amazon SNS Mobile Push. If you've done any of this, uh, and we're going to show how, how simple it is. Again, network engineer, uh, not hardcore developer. Um, I, can, I can do this, so you certainly can do this. Um, so direct push is straightforward. Broadcasting uh, to millions of devices with SNS topics, very straightforward. Only a few lines of code to subscribe and send a, pu a published notification across platforms. That's pretty cool. One message that I send to a million devices, and I don't care whether they're on APNS, GCM, you know, all the different platforms. And just to give you an idea of some people that are using SNS uh, Mobile Push for these use cases, so secret, as we uh, heard today from Andy, they're one of our customers, they're using SNS Mobile Push. And here's a great stat that they launched their Android application um, using SNS Mobile Push with zero provisioning. And the interesting thing about that was is, you know, they're very successful on the iOS platform, but how they, did, they had no idea what the uptake was going to be on Android, and they didn't have to plan for any of that using our platform. And then the broadcast use case, uh, Halfbrick is a uh, game developer, so for mobile games, uh, and they use a combination of broadcasting um, and sophisticated analytics to actually send notifications very targeted to end users, uh, or send notifications to abroad that's like, hey, we've got a new feature in the game that you should come check out. There's a new jetpack available that's going to make your, your gameplay 100 times more exciting. Right? Um, and that's, so they use a, the topic uh, piece to do that. It makes it very easy to fan out across multiple platforms. And we can start to think of different ways to use topics. And this is going to become important when we think about how user interaction um, actually can start to be used in notifications. But we can have many different topics with many different subscribers across the different platforms for many different reasons. And you get to pick the, the topics. You could even, in theory, and not in theory, I'm going to show you in a demo, you could allow users to subscribe to topics that they, want, that they care about, the information that you're pushing to. So we'll show you that in just a minute. And here's a closed loop infrastructure. So this is uh, one of our customers, Plumby, is doing something similar to this. If you were here last year, you heard from them. But a closed loop infrastructure is 
you can imagine an architecture where your mobile app itself is sending information about how the user is using the app, whether it's clickstream information, whether it's uh, you know, information about how long they stayed in a certain screen, how long they have been playing the game, um, you know, which might be scary statistics sometimes. Uh, those that type of information. And we need somewhere to send that, so we would send it to Amazon Kinesis. If you're not familiar with that, that's our streaming ingest service. And our SDKs allow you to push things or put things via HTTP call into Kinesis. We have worker nodes behind Kinesis that are constantly grabbing that information and starting to inject it into Redshift from a data warehousing perspective. And now that we've got this information, we can start to allow our marketers that are trying to sell our app and get more user engagement to start to think about how they can do these little campaigns. So they can you know, maybe even teach a marketing person how to write SQL, be interesting. Plumby did it, very interesting. So they can write these SQL queries that are gonna give them a list of users based on, um, you know, uh, based on their usage. So you know, very high level SQL here uh, going into, um, into Redshift. So the query would be, you know, this user has not clicked this new feature. We should tell them about it, right? This new part of the game is not there. We should tell them, again, the fact that, hey, this is gonna make your game fun, you know, way, way better and more interesting from a, an engagement perspective. So they write up the SQL query. It reaches into Redshift. It does its crunches over a huge amount of data because we've been, you know, stream data. It grabs a list of uh, users we wanna send push notifications to, subscribes them all to a topic, and then you send a single push to that topic and it fans out that information. So this is an example of how you sort of get into the closed loop realm. And if we combine these three tools, we start to get into some pretty interesting ways to, if we go with the animation, thank you, some interesting ways to build user experiences. In fact, we're seeing applications now over the last six months even that are just notifications. There's actually not that much involved in the application. The whole point of the application is to get a push notification to a user about something that they care about. And we're using direct push, we're using broadcasting, we're using closed loop um, analytics-based targeted uh, push notifications to get here, to get to the point where we can actually uh, start to build an interesting user experience that may, maybe is 95% notification-based. But how can that be? How can um, you know, push be the user experience? Think of a use case where a notification is good enough. You know, I get notifications about various news articles. Some of them I ignore, some of them I don't. Um, quick person-to-person -person messaging apps. I don't wanna get a push notification, click, it takes me into the app, maybe I have to authenticate because my session expired and then respond and then back out. Um, smart check-ins with a click. You know, I'm, I, I walk into a Starbucks and I wanna check in here without um, without, again, opening the app, authenticating, and doing all of those things. And then starting to get into sort of context-aware pushes uh, and, and making things expire when they're no longer relevant. The idea is to get, get the user to not necessarily open the app, but they're still interacting with you. Maybe you're collecting data about how they're using uh, the various push notifications, but you want to make it easy for your end users to interact with the various things that are important to your application. And by combining all those tools, you can get there. It's complicated. It's not that hard but you have to put some thinking in, into how this user interaction is, is going to manifest itself to the end user. Here's an example of interactive push if you're familiar with the new iOS, again, sorry, iOS developer, um, the new iOS interactive push capabilities of iOS 8. You can actually start to control what happens on the notification screen or when the notification itself comes in. Um, so I'm not, not sure if we can read it, but you know, welcome to Las Vegas, click the invent button, I can then custom create a, um, an action that happens with that button. Something, it's going to go do something. It's going to, uh, very specific to, to the application, it's gonna give feedback into my application, which I might feed back into my own backend API. I might push that feedback back into Kinesis, like all those different things you can start to tie into uh, a push notification. And of course, context aware. Uh, oftentimes our push notifications aren't relevant anymore. And you know, the different platforms have different ways of, of dealing with this. Um, but you know, if, if it was a location-based type of push or something that was a, about the context that I'm in now and I don't see that push until six hours later, well, it's kind of irrelevant to me. And really, I don't wanna be bothered six hours later on irrelevant stuff. So here's an example of a, a quick little message on the GCM platform that enables TTL, start to expire it. 3,600 seconds is probably a little short unless you're doing something totally micro, uh, but it's an example of how it could be done. 
but this introduces a new complexity. When notifications become the user experience, delivery must be reliable, interaction should be easy, and that's more on the platform side, right? Feedback has to be timely, so we have to be able to interact and, and understand what the user has done and be able to present that back. And when context, context changes, so should the notification or maybe just expire completely. And, and we've already discovered that push notification uh, is tough to scale and tough to build, which means it's tough to make it reliable. Because of all the different interactions that we're trying to maintain in the scaling, we have a pretty big challenge on our hands to make sure that we're actually sending the most important thing to your device, especially if your device, if the application itself is only about push. It's a news ag aggregation application. My, my users don't open the app all that often. They just get the push notifications. If they don't get the push notifications, they're not going to come back to my application. They're not going to be interacting with my application. I won't be able to sell ads, like do all those types of things, right? A couple of things that are new um, since last year. So if you haven't been following what we've done, uh, we've released a quite a, a few different things for SNS Mobile Push. Um, one of the big ones, and I'll get talk about a, a little bit about this in just a moment, is uh, Baiju Cloud Push. I, I'm, I apologize if I pronounce that wrong. I do every time. Um, but it's for pushing to uh, Android platforms in China, which, as we all know, is a massive, massive market in terms of number of mobile devices. Windows push notification service, Microsoft push notification service for Windows phone, so phone desktop push notifications through SNS mobile push. Again, a single API that allows you to interact with these things. Cross-platform TTL, and of course all the platforms handle TTL a little bit differently, but we've you know, given you some tools to, before we even send the push notification into the platform that we can expire. We've made this available in GovCloud, so if you're working on an application that has a very specific ITAR requirement, you can use push through GovCloud. We've introduced something that's a little bit more SNS as a whole focus, but the concept of large topics is really driven out of the mobile application requirement of I want to send you know, one message to a million users and I need a topic that will handle that many endpoints as part of it. And of course, we're very proud to have released iOS, iOS 8 interactive push and large payload capability uh, the day after iOS 8 went GTM and Apple released it to the market. So. Um, very, very quick and no coding, again, for your application to be able to support those things. You just change the message type as you send it to us. So a note on why Baiju is cool. So if you're familiar with pushing in China, it's complicated. In the rest of the world, we have a handful of different platforms that we work with, but China looks a little bit more like this. Um, basically, GCM just, just doesn't have a, a huge presence in China. Uh, and the way we, push notifications are enabled in China is through app stores, and there are hundreds of app stores. So that means you have to start to interact with all of those app stores to be able to send push notifications. Um, with SNS Mobile Push and Baiju Cloud Push, we've pulled these together so that, again, you're still using a single API, so you don't have to change anything in the code, just the message type, and interact with Baiju to be able to send push notifications to any device regardless of the app store that they're subscribed to. And how do we do that? Well, Baiju actually gets you to install a client as part of your application that interacts with their backend systems. That's kind of how that works. Um, so that simplifies significantly the ability to push to Android device, devices in China. Okay, let's go through a little bit of how this all works. If you haven't set up a, an SNS mobile push app to push to, it's really straightforward. So the first thing we need to do is go and get credentials for the platform we're trying to push, uh, push to. So, uh, with APNS, it's a weird hang handshake with a bunch of SSL certificates. First time you do it, it's going to be painful. I know a bunch of you probably have already gone through that. Um, GCM, we need to get API keys down from Google so that we can tie into this. For ADM, there is a client ID, client secret. The other platforms have similar sort of concepts to be able to authenticate your application to the platform itself. You need to get that credential from them, use their directions to, to get so in their documentation. And then we take that into SNS mobile, uh, mobile push into the console and register the app. And we call it an app too. And so it means you've got an app on top of an app and you're building an app. And you know, you've got to be very careful about what you're calling an app. We call it an app too. But you take that credential and you upload it to an app. And depending on the platform, there's a sort of one-to-one -one ratio between an app and the platform you're using. So just to make it even more complicated, we've got app, 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 app that you're actually sending push notifications to, one per platform. 
Those can all be tied back to SNS topics and all those different things, but it's, you, they're, they're separate, separate uh, apps within our console, and I'll show you that in just a moment. The third thing to do is once you've got everything set up with the provider and you've got everything set up with, the, with um, SNS Mobile Push, is you have to get a device token for your application running on the device. And this is how, uh, when you send, uh, this is how the device knows where to fork the message to on the local device, right? So, and this is done using the SDKs that are provided by the platform. It typically, is to, you do it with the device, right on the device. So with APNS, again, you make a request, you create a specific object that makes a request into APNS to get that information. And we have to feed that back into SNS, because SNS needs to know that device endpoint, that initial device endpoint, to send all information to the various platforms. And there's a couple of ways you feed that back into SNS. You can build out your own API system if you have a backend system already that's collecting device tokens. You can inject that um, directly into SNS Mobile Push using one of our SDKs, any of the popular languages. Um, we can uh, import, if, you know, if you've been doing this for a while and you're doing a migration, you can use a CSV import to get all the device tokens that are currently active on your system into SNS Mobile Push. And for future devices, um, you know, we either register again through the API or you could register directly into uh, SNS Mobile Push from the device, which is cool because that's one less thing in your API you need to maintain. Or potentially you start to build out no backend systems or maybe just a backend system just to send the notification. But the registration piece is all handled by the device interacting with SNS Mobile Push. And we use Amazon Cognito uh, credentials, if you're familiar with Cognito, to actually be able to authenticate to our APIs. Uh, and I'm going to show you that. Here is you know, some code from a, uh, a backend. This is a, using our Java library um, for device registration. Very straightforward. Again, you get the token. You send it to SNS Mobile Push by the app, uh, what we call an ARN, ARN, Amazon, Amazon resource name. And you get back a, another ARN, which is the endpoint for the device. And that's the thing you need to be able to send a push notification to that device. Here's the uh, device self-registration for iOS. So it's using a, a Cognito credential, which is right there, to go uh, to get the device token from APNS and then push it up into uh, SNS. And then you can you know, either receive the endpoint ARN for the device from SNS and store it on the device somewhere, send it to a backend system, or you could set up uh, within the application itself on SNS mobile pu uh, push platform, it will send a notification saying, hey, I've got a new device registered and here's the ARN for it. It's all you know, built into the platform. You can do it that way. Um, with no backend, very interesting. And then we need to send a push. And through the console, we've provided the ability to send a push, you know, just by typing stuff in. Um, you know, you can control, you know, message, message formats that are specific to the platform. But of course, that doesn't scale, so we'll actually want, probably want to do that through some sort of an API, because you don't really want to pay somebody to sit there and send a million pushes every day. So we do that through the API. Here's an example of the code that you would use uh, very high level to do it through our Python uh, SDK, Bodo. Very straightforward. Then we receive the, the push notification and process it the exact same way as you would have um, using your own backend system or using another um, uh, push notification system. So now we get into the fun part. I'm actually going to go through a little bit of code. We're going to, again, hope that the demo gods prey on us today. So uh, just give me a moment to get switched over here. Okay, so I have written a very, very basic, straightforward, simple application um, on iOS 8 using Objective-C. I haven't made the switch to Swift yet, but the, you know, the models and the frameworks are actually pretty close to the same. They work the same way, but with the Swift you know, twist to it. Uh, the first thing that happens when the application launches is we register a bunch of things and then we make a call to actually uh, register it with AP APNS. These blocks of code that we have here, the UI mutable user notification action, are for interactive pushes. And I'm going to show you how that works. Um, this is all just Apple documentation stuff. You can certainly look this up um, through, their, uh, through their documentation. We're making calls to the AWS APIs. And as part of our SDK, we provide an error um, capture mechanism, so I've got um, any error that happens being logged to the console so that I can do troubleshooting. And I'm going to use Cognito Data Sync um, synchronization services for some of the um, 
data that I need to maintain about the device because I have no back-end system behind this application at all. There's, it's not interacting with any API that I've written. So we use Cognito to sort of maintain state between you know, device uh, application closes and such. Once you've uh, spun up the application, you get a device token back. We fire off the did register for remote notifications with device tokens method, um, which is done automatically by Apple once you get the, uh, the piece back. And here's the code that we go ahead to, uh, that we have in here to actually create and send that device token back to Mo uh, SNS Mobile Push to the app specifically that we are trying to send, and then getting the endpoint ARN back, which again is the device ID for this device specifically, and we're gonna need that later to subscribe it to a topic and to send a push notification to. So very straightforward. So you know, now, now that we've got that running, let's go ahead and take a look at the console. So here's my app. I'm using the APNS Sandbox in this case. I've got a couple of different devices uh, registered. I'm going to show you my old iPhone 4. If I want to send a, a test push notification, I'm just going to go ahead, click Publish, use platform-specific message JSON. I'll give you an example JSON block for APNS. And before I click Go, excuse me. Oh. That's an ugly mug. Let's see if this is going to, uh, this might not work, but we will try it anyways. Device is unlocked. So you can see the device there. And if all things go as planned, there we go. Pretty straightforward to do some testing. So the next piece of that, the, the application that I wrote was, okay, that's great, I can send a direct push notification, got it, thanks. Um, what about that whole topic thing that you were talking about a little bit? Okay, well, let's show you that. So I wrote the application um, to allow me as an end user to subscribe to a topic of interest um, to me. In this case, it's the news, very generic. So here is my, oh. you see that okay? Here's the actual application user interface. So very simple, very straightforward. It's just a quick logo. It tells me that I you know, can now get push notifications and I've got a little locker slide switch, which you can kind of see. So if I want to subscribe to the news in this application, if I flip the switch, which you can't actually see the flip, but now I've subscribed to the news. And remember, I, I don't have any API backend on this. This has actually made a call to SNS directly to subscribe my endpoint ARN that I got before when I registered to that SNS topic. So if we go ahead and look at the topic itself, I'm gonna refresh. Um, you have to trust me here, but I'm unsubscribing. Refresh, and the device is gone. Resubscribe, device is there. Again, no backend API, all directly done from the device. And then if I wanna send a message to this, it's as simple as a publish. And I mentioned before that we can do this thing, you know, cross-message publishing uh, across all the different platforms. So again, we give you a little bit of example code. I'm going to ignore everything else and just try this. And we'll try our little trick again here. See that okay? There we go. As you can tell, I need some, to do some uh, cleanup on the way I handle the actual push notification message. I'm just dumping the whole JSON to the alert view. So it's that straightforward. And had I wanted to send that, that message to uh, you know, um, GCM or any of the other platforms, it was just a matter of a different JSON block with a single publish. And you can do all this through code as well, of course. Let's take a look real quickly. I want to show you um, the, the actual piece where we do the subscribe, unsubscribe, because it's really, you know, again, not all that complicated to do. So we're using a Cognito credential that we've already received just by opening up the application. It's how we registered the push notification. Uh, you can see right here, here's where I go to the app delegate to grab that Cognito information, because it's, that's where it's uh, stored. Uh, in here, I'm subscribing to the new topic. So I create an object and push it to the new topic, and it just goes up. And then I have to uh, receive a feedback from that 
that says, hey, this is um, where I want to get the information from. And then I subscribe that to the actual publish, uh, to the, the SNS topic. So very, very straight, um, you know, not very much code. And I'm maintaining state of this so that I can, you know, when I load the screen, the view controller, I can see where the slider is. Very straightforward. And then from an interactive perspective, we can do this through this platform as well. So I'm just gonna switch back here and show you um, a really quick, oops, really quick alert. Hopefully I don't have any JSON errors. Let me type it. Like that. That one is backwards. Okay. Um, I need my FaceTime back. So we should get a notification. There it is. And if I pull up the notification center, I should have an interactive, a custom interactive, yeah, I do. There, there we go, there's a custom interactive, you can see on the blue button it says invent. So that's a custom thing that I can now tie an action to. All I did was change the message format. So that's, uh, that's kind of, the, that's kind of the, the different pieces. So you can see how this is pretty straightforward and easy to do. Um, but I want you to hear a little bit of a real world example of this. So I'd like to uh, invite Sean up onto the stage from Mailbox. So he can go through and tell us some of the interesting things that they are doing with SNS Mobile Push. Sean? Thanks. All right, thanks Rich. So I'm Sean, I lead the uh, engineering team for Mailbox at Dropbox and I was one of the original engineers on the team when we first set out building, building Mailbox. And so what I wanna do today is walk you through kind of our journey of push over the past two years and uh, give you a little bit of insight into what matters for us and why and kind of where that journey has led us today with SNS. So for those of you that don't know about Mailbox, uh, in 2012, we had a company, pretty small company that was uh, focused on making people more productive and efficient. And we realized that email was kind of the default place where we collaborated and communicated with, with each other, but it was a pretty terribly broken place for doing a lot of that, especially on mobile. So we set out to redesign the inbox to make email light, fast, and mobile friendly. And we launched a little over a year and a half ago. And excuse me. All right, so for email, in today's kind of hyper-connected world, we're judged in a lot of ways by how responsive we are, how quickly we respond to emails from our boss, how quickly we collaborate with other people through email. And so push is actually an incredibly important aspect of what we've built. Um, and we kind of knew that from day one. It was actually a big reason why we built a cloud infrastructure to kind of sit in between um, the device and your email is to give you really reliable push that wasn't dependent on any kind of like background polling. The messages were delivered as soon as the email hit your inbox. And uh, so for us, we needed very fast, reliable messages at the moment that you got them, and we needed them to be extremely, extremely consistent. Because if you got a, a push notification 20 minutes after you read an email, it's pretty confusing, and, and people actually get pretty angry when that happens. So we needed to, a, a way of, of guaranteeing extremely fast uh, push notifications right when the email hit your inbox. And for us, push was... It, there's more to it than just the content being delivered. Badge count often, uh, in our application, badge count is used to tell you how much stuff you have to do, how many messages you need to respond to. That's run through push. And as we, we originally set out building this on iOS 6, um, where backgrounding wasn't possible, but since then, with iOS 7 and Android, uh, using push as, as a silent mechanism to keep your inbox in sync, if you have push off or if you have it on, as a way for your device to wake up, get your email, because no one likes waiting. So having all of your email there for you is, is important for us to be able to compete with, with the native mail application on your device. So all these requirements lead us to 
kind of what was originally almost an impossible problem. And so I want to walk you through where the, the, the journey that these requirements have led us on. So because our customers really expect a world-class push experience, um, we set out kind of, when we first started building this in 2012, we had four engineers total, our iOS app, our backend, kind of everything up and down. And so anywhere that we could offload operational overhead, use a system that we could rely on, we were looking for those, those opportunities. So we started out with a third party uh, push infrastructure, push application provider. Um, and it was great at, at, at the beginning, but we kind of hit a scale that we didn't expect. And uh, we found that our use case was uh, pretty unpredictable. The, the, the latency was unpredictable. It was a black box. We couldn't really control anything. Um, and it was pretty pricey for what we were using. So in summer of 2013, we kind of set out to build our own push notification infrastructure, uh, which many of you might have done similarly around that time. And so we had a queuing system. We had a cluster running machines. Uh, we built the APNS protocol. We built the Android protocol. We tested it. We got ready to deploy it. And about a week before we were about to deploy it, Amazon announced SNS. And we kind of looked through the announcement, talked to a few folks over at AWS, and we said, well, I guess we're going to be throwing that thing away that we just spent three months working on. And it was a great, it was actually the right trade off for us because what it meant is we no longer had to do the ongoing DevOps costs, the ongoing development costs, say when iOS 8 changed the API. Uh, we didn't have to worry about that. When we launched Android, we didn't have to worry about that. Um, and it was a lot, a lot more cost effective for us. We immediately just started saving money. So in earlier this year, we did kind of a silent cut over on iOS, and then we launched Android straight onto SNS. And so today, where that journey has led us is we're sending hundreds of millions of pushes uh, per week. Um, uh, so we, are, we launched our Android app uh, in April of this year. And we, did, we had no idea of what our uptake was going to be. So we, we provisioned our application servers to be able to handle the load. That, that we predicted, but we just didn't even worry about SNS at all. And in fact, the way that we had our abstractions built, it was a couple hours of configuration tweaking and testing, and Android push was just working. Um, and we got other, other like, things that were less obvious, like the feedback channel to know which devices got deactivated. Users, I mean, today, all of us probably have five devices over the past you know, three years that we've used in some, some form. And for us being able to know at the volume that we're looking up devices and constructing messages to send, that, infra that cost on our infrastructure just from a database perspective uh, is pretty high. And so being able to know the devices that are no longer active very, very easily with a very clean and simple interface has just been profoundly impactful on the, the cost of those, uh, those reads on our database and has actually enabled us to focus on building a caching system to get there. And then this past Monday, we actually just released our iOS 8 app uh, update with interactive push notifications. And it was kind of the same story. We just changed a couple configuration parameters, updated our app, and we were done. So it's been, it's been quite a journey for us. And we've been very, very happy to land where we've landed, cost effective and very low overhead for us. Um, yeah, so I'll be around afterwards to answer any specific questions. And we have a booth. Uh, down in the expo area if anyone wants to chat later, too. But I think Rich and I are going to take any questions you all have. Um, so from an error handling, handling perspective, I mean, there is, you know, we built it in such a way that we can send push notifications and retries and do all those things so that it abstracts it from what, um, from what you need to worry about. Um, we do have feedback mechanisms as part of subscribing to actions, which is you know, delivery didn't make it and those types of feedback. Basically what happens is we send a feedback item back into a SNS topic, which you can then subscribe your backend API to and then get that information. Um, so th that's kind of where we're at with that at the moment. It mostly depends on the TTL that you would set, um, but a, a lot of it is feedback from the push, the, the push providers as well. The, the uh, device didn't get registered properly or hasn't received the information properly.
the protocol is also really confusing, or it used to be, for being able to figure out which devices are uh, no longer active. And so that became like way simpler for us to be able to figure out. Will SNS ever deregister the device? Is that was the question? Remo so it, it just remove it rather than you get a notification that the device is deregistered? Well, some of the, you know, you might want to take action on that, right? So, you know, we've, we've built in the tools that allow you to do that, but I don't know if it would necessarily be something that would just be automatic. Any other questions? Great. Well, thanks very much, folks, for coming, and thanks, Sean, for uh, speaking. Please do evaluate, uh, evaluate the session. We'd love to hear your feedback on, on how well we did so we can be better next year. Um, and also, we have a lot of different mobile sessions going on. So please do check them out. You know, there's ones on Cognito, ones on back-end systems, and um, you know, back-endless back systems and those types of things. So check them out and enjoy the show.